Before getting into the lesson, we are grateful the cones have arrived back home safely. We're thankful for our visitors who are with us. You are a welcome guest. And we certainly, for those of us, Joanne and I are traveling and the others who are going to the UK for work there, covet your prayers, a safe trip there and back and while we're there. Brother Jeff will be speaking while I'm gone. He is, as we said before, in a gospel meeting at the Bellevue Church of Christ, Pensacola, beginning today. Keep them in your prayers. And we certainly hope much good will come from that. We don't think much when we're thinking of the giving of the Great Commission about Luke's account of the commission, but it's there. In Luke 24, as the letter is closing out, or the book of Luke is, beginning in verse 46, he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And, of course, he's speaking to the apostles, so he says, And ye are witnesses of these things. Verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. That is, in fact, Luke's account of what we have in Matthew 28 and Mark 16 of their great commission, which we're mostly familiar with, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 to 16. Or in Matthew 28, 18, beginning, all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. We're mindful also of Paul's teaching to the young evangelist Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Each one of us, as a member of the church, and our various capacities should be striving to do what we can to teach others the truth about Jesus Christ. We should desire for them to know how to be saved from sin. We have uttered more times than I can ever remember how that sin governs this world, that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, that everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death, Romans 3, 23, and chapter 6, verse 23. You may have a lot of problems right now. I don't know, but there's a lot of people who do, and we all have face problems of various kinds, some not so bad, some very bad, but none of them are as bad as the sin problem. The sin problem is the only thing that can keep you out of heaven and send you eternally to a devil's hell. If you sum up the work of Jesus Christ the only begotten Son of God, John 3, 16. His work was to solve the sin problem. Now, I have seen mathematicians, physicists, and others who use higher math, especially before computers, and even now, just fill up marker boards with all sorts of equations. I one time in looking through dissertations in the University of Texas library 
just to see what people are written on because I was looking for a topic myself. And I got over in the math section and I, I found, of course they bind them, you know, and put them in the library. And here was one that was bound and counting the hardback bound, binding and what was in it, it just was not a quarter inch thick. I thought, now this is interesting. So I opened it up and it was in mathematics of some sort or the other. And it was dealing with one equation on about two or three sheets of paper. And that was the doctoral dissertation. Now you say, well, what was it about? I have no idea. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. I brought Keith Cohn's dissertation home for his daddy to proof. And on the plane, I decided I'd look at it. And I got through maybe the first paragraph and shut it up because I had no idea what in the world he was talking about. Well, there's a lot of subjects like that. There's a lot of problems. A lot of them take a lot of effort, a lot of learning to solve them. And solving them does a great deal of good for mankind while we live on this earth. But the problem that haunts all men who are accountable to God for their actions and are limited by time and space to whatever time we have here is sin. Men today are secular for the most part, so they think of while they're here, and they govern themselves according to what you need here. And they occupy their minds with the affairs of this present world. Now, we all are here. God made us physically. He put us in a material world. He knows we have physical needs. But He also has taught us over and over and over and over again that the chief concern and the chief problem about which we should be concerned more than anything else is being forgiven of our sins. Now God's done His part. He has done that which we could never do for ourselves. I mentioned John 3.16 a while ago, a passage most know if they know anything but I doubt they really understand what the message is. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Many quote that as saying, well, all you have to do is accept the truth about Jesus, call on Him as Savior, and that's the end of it. That passage does not say that at all. It does tell us about how far God's love goes in doing for us what we never, never could do for ourselves. And when you understand the grace of God, the favor God has bestowed upon us, then you understand that when we once sinned, what we deserved was eternal separation from God. Now that's what we all deserve. You don't want to get from God what you deserve. I don't. If you do, you need some uh, adjustment in your thinking and understanding. What I want from God is mercy. I want His favor. I want to be forgiven of my sins. That is, wherein I have transgressed God's law either by omission, omitting what God obligates me to do, or violating it, I want to do that, whatever it is. You can see the desire that should be on our minds when you see the results of the first recorded gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. As Peter stood up with the rest of the apostles and you read his sermon, he's offering evidence. Now the people listening to him are devout Jews. They are dedicated to doing what they understand God wants them to do to be pleasing to him, which was keep the law of Moses. If you read the list of people that were there, to keep the law of Moses, they'd make great sacrifice to be there in Jerusalem on that feast day. It was required of the men to be in Jerusalem three times a year. They were there. There's a list of all those Jews from all over the Roman world there to do what they believe God required of them. And the scripture calls them devout people. They're dedicated. They're not 
slipshod hypocrites. They're not like the Pharisees and chief priests and others. They're devout men gathered out of every nation under heaven. Well, they're going to hear something that's going to change their whole life from their own out. And if you will read, which we will not do now, Acts chapter 2 and Peter's sermon that inspiration is recorded for us, you'll see that Peter begins with the scriptures and that with which they were very familiar. And he shows that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah. And he makes it clear that you have rejected them and if wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. The love of God there and to cure their sin problem meant they had to come to grips with things in their life. It couldn't be swept under the rug. You just don't deal with sin with a feather duster. It takes the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God, the Gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16, was preached in its fullness on that day by the apostles, Peter's sermon recorded. Peter showed them from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus Christ of Nazareth fulfilled all those passages. But that wasn't all that he did. There were the witnesses, the apostles, who said, we saw it and we know now, the law required two or three witnesses for every word to be established. You've got a lot more than that there. But there's more than that. Miracles, signs, and wonders were worked that no mortal could do. They spake as the Spirit gave them utterance. There had been the sound of a rushing mighty wind, but no wind. And it came down from heaven. And came into the place where they were. And cloven tongues like as a fire. Not fire, but looked like it. Set upon each one. And they began to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Now when you put the totality of the information provided there. To men who are already described as devout men. Then you begin to see what can happen. Now, at first, they were challenged, saying, you know, well, what's going on here? Some, there's always one in every crowd. No matter how serious and sober the situation is, somebody can make light of it. So somebody said they're filled with new wine. And Peter began right there and said, no, no, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Drunks don't usually start getting drunk at 9 in the morning. That's not the way it usually works in their culture and their situation. You've got to remember, it was addressed then to them and their situation. <clears throat> and so he began to preach the gospel and call them to realize. He didn't hesitate. He said, look around you. Listen to what I'm saying. Draw from your own Bible knowledge. The totality of the information said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Messiah, the only Savior of the world. Jesus had declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John chapter 14, verse 6. He had also taught the apostles in that same chapter that if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. American Standard 1901, John 14, 15. So they heard that. They were not a people devoid of Old Testament knowledge. They were not devoid of understanding faithful obedience to God. They believed in God the Father. They had to be persuaded that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was His only begotten Son, that He had all authority given to Him by the Father. As Matthew 28, Jesus speaking, said in Matthew by inspiration recording. They had to be caused to understand that now we can't approach God just on the basis of our faithful adherence to the law of Moses. We can only approach God through Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. 
if you want to read what they knew about God's suffering servant, they had had the uh, book of Isaiah alone. They had had it for 750 years. Do you think they knew Isaiah 53? If you turn over into the book of Acts, the Ethiopian eunuch, riding through a desert place called Gaza, still bears that name today, returning from Jerusalem where he had worshipped under the law, going back down to Ethiopia, was studying the scriptures. And he was reading in Isaiah 53. And he didn't understand it because he didn't have the New Testament to reveal to him the meaning of chapter 53. So he asked Philip, the preacher sent by God, to join him. Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? And Philip did what every member of the church ought to be able to do because of their knowledge of the Bible. He began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. He preached Jesus, and that word Jesus means Savior. He preached to him Savior. Savior from what? From those sins I mentioned earlier. Jesus came, tempted every point like as we are, yet without sin. Thus he could be the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world as John the forerunner of the Christ announced him to his people that Jesus was. Thus he could go to the cross, die on that cross for the sins of the whole world. And what John is saying in John 3 and verse 16 is that you must accept the evidence proving Jesus Christ to be the Son of God and you must believe. That's the beginning. There's not a soul going to be saved by Jesus that doesn't believe on the basis of the evidence of the Scriptures. But that Scripture doesn't say that's the only thing there is to do. Notice it again. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, what's that next word? Should not perish. Well, there can be believers, but they can perish. And James, writing to Christians, talks about them in a the whole chapter, James chapter 2. And he talks about faith apart from works is dead, being alone. These are not meritorious works. That is, we do them and things get credit and a pile up so high of good things done, it outweighs the bad things we did over here. He's talking about works of obedience. He's talking about the kind of works that Noah reveals to us and Moses records. When it is said in Genesis 6, 8, Noah found grace in God's sight. That did not exclude Noah's obedience to the pattern God showed him to build the ark. It just meant that God favored Noah. Now here's the plan, Noah. Hebrews 11 makes it clear that it was by faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Noah, by faith, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Now that's what James talks about when he says faith apart from works is dead. It's not any kind of system we worked up beginning and ending with man's ingenuity. So those two kind of works are all kicked out. It's not works of the law of Moses. That's clear. Because when you read Acts 2, you see that those works, though they were people devoted to them, wouldn't save anybody any longer. Now what? Well, they cried out being convinced that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God. And it pricked them in their inward man, their heart. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And 99.9999% of denominational preachers today would have looked at them and said, Nothing. Oh, how do I know that? Because that's what they say. Why, you mentally affirm from the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, there's nothing else to do. Your Bible doesn't teach that. And that's the standard of judgment. 
by which you'll give account to Jesus on the day of judgment. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. But they cried out as believers. Now you're back to John 3, 16. They should be saved. Well, these believers, believing on the evidence preached and the miracles done, were caused to accept the gospel as from men, or from God and not from men. The gospel for which Paul said, I'm not ashamed because it's the power of God to save. The gospel that was to be preached to the whole world as we read in the beginning. They wanted to know what was there that they could do now that they stood before God condemned having rejected and murdered the very Messiah they longed to see. They didn't recognize him because they didn't understand the law of Moses. You see, remember that Ethiopian eunuch? <coughs> they didn't recognize Jesus Christ for the same reason that Ethiopian eunuch and other reasons too didn't recognize who's being talked about in Isaiah 53. But just as Peter did, so Philip did. He preached unto him Jesus. And you read through the book of Acts and you see the preaching done there. You see they followed the same pattern presenting the truth to convert people to Christ. And as believers, since they should be saved, and they cried out evidencing their anguish of spirit and conviction of the sins upon them as devout religious people. Sincerely devout but lost religious people. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter didn't answer like these preachers today, many of them. He said, as a believer, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and your children and all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And the Lord calls through the gospel message. That's the reason that Mark 16 Verse 15 says it must be preached to the whole world. God calls all men to salvation through the gospel message. Preach to every creature. If you'll read Colossians in the first chapter, you'll see by the time Paul wrote that letter, that is even while the New Testament was being written, that he said it had been done in that generation. That's an amazing thing to me. Didn't mean that every single solitary person had someone sit down and teach the Bible to them. It meant that everyone had had the opportunity to know the truth of the gospel. That was their job under the Great Commission. And they did it according to the inspired Paul. He wrote to the church in Colossae in chapter 1. It is the truth that convicts one of sin. It is the truth that shows what life is all about, where you came from, what you're here for, and where you're going. It's the truth that tells us about heaven and hell. No wonder then that Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And Paul comes along to Timothy and says, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own, their well, sheep and themselves, teachers having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. Now listen to what Titus, what Paul said to Titus, another young preacher, concerning this very system whereby we learn how God through Christ solved the sin problem for you and for me. Listen to him. For the grace of God, chapter 2 and verse 11 of Titus. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. All right. But that favor of God did what? Well, he's speaking of Jesus Christ here, folks. Now watch verse 12. Sentence didn't end verse 11. There's a comma there. So he's continuing on. Teaching us that grace of God, as old preachers used to say, the grace of God came teaching. 
Teaching us is something you must do, I must do, works of obedience. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. For the child of God, the faithful member of Christ's church, notice what he's to be doing. Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now watch, he goes back to what he did for us. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem, that is, purchase us from all iniquity and purify himself unto himself a peculiar, that actually is a purchased people zealous of good works now what are you to do about this Titus you're a preacher of the gospel listen to what Paul tells you these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority let no man despise thee Christian who is dedicated to teaching the whole counsel of God is mindful of the fact that he's teaching the only way men can be saved. He's teaching the way God's ordained in the word of God for people to gain remission of sins, be reconciled to God, to stand justified in his sight, to be a child of God in the body of Christ, the church, the family of God. He can't afford to sit back and, well, let's kind of water it down here. He has no authority to do that. It must be preached in its plainness, boldness, and its fullness. That's very important. In that marvelous chapter that Paul wrote on love, in 1 Corinthians 13, he gives you several of the marks of agape love, which is the highest form of love. Greeks had four words for love. We're talking about one of them. This is the love that always seeks another's highest good. Now that love is going to seek your eternal blessings. That's the highest good. To get you to heaven is the highest good you can think about. To keep you out of hell is an amazing thing. And the only thing that can do that is Jesus. How? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's by the gospel, God's power to save you from sin, Romans 1.16. And you'll notice here that all of these qualities of agape love that always seeks another's highest good, motivates the child of God. This is, this is the love of John 3.16 that's being talked about. It's a divine commentary on that one word love in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Watch what you have. In verse 6 of 1 John, or rather 1 Corinthians 13. He says, love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. There may be a lot of folks telling you they, they love you, but if they corrupt the truth, they don't. They may tell themselves they love God, but if they don't believe in obedience to the gospel, they're fooling themselves. They're deceived. So we ought to rejoice not in that which is contrary to God's will, that which is sinful, but that which is according to the truth of God's word. Remember John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So truth at all costs that pertains to the forgiveness of our sins and once we obey it to become Christians living the Christian life ought to take precedent over everything there is in this world. It may seem a bit hard but I don't think so. Sometimes truth is hard to accept. But it doesn't change it. It's still the truth. But sometimes being a Christian can be very, very lonely when you stand for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, no matter what the cost there is to you. That's the reason that when you find Jesus teaching, there is that which causes men to have to consider the costs of discipleship. And God never 
As the old country song used to say, never promise you a rose garden. Jesus did promise a cross. Take up your cross, he said, and follow him. The health and wealth, a bunch of stuff that goes on and passes is the Christian message is as contrary to New Testament teaching concerning Christianity as anything I can think of. You never see the Lord approaching people along that line. The Bible describes Christ himself as a man of sorrow because he denied himself the affairs of this world to save us. He solved the sin problem. He blazed the trail and he knows how to get you from here to heaven. If you'll follow him. If you'll submit to him. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And be made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. I have no right to change that, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. I can preach it. I can show what's implied by it in your life and my life. But I have no right to change it. I have no right to change well, it's not as bad as Christ makes it out to be. Where do I get the right to do that? Where do I have the authority to do that? Where is there anything in the Bible that teaches me to do that? The greatest comfort that there is is to know you're reconciled to God and you're justified in His sight and you're on His side. Therefore be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. In closing the lesson, I hope then that you see that when we look at the love of God, when we look at the love Christians ought to have toward God and with one another and a world lost in sin, that will remember the greatest problem that ever comes upon anybody, anywhere, anytime is a sin problem. But above that, Christ has solved it. And he's presented it to us in the divine volume, the Bible. And if we will be, as Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. We'll learn what's right. God is not trying to hide things from us. Paul said to those pagans on Mars Hill that he wasn't far from any of us. Now that tells me he wants to be found, but he made you a free moral agent. You can either cultivate love for spiritual things or love for this present world that's going to pass away. You can want to learn how God says, I've solved the problem. Or you can go on and act like there is no problem. But there's one thing for certain. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after that the judgment. Every atheist, every pagan, every whoever, the best of Christians, it's appointed unto men once to die. Then there's that day when Paul talked about we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the deeds done in the body whether good or bad. It doesn't end the moment your heart stops. You just simply leave this body and the same you goes over into a place totally and radically different from what you've occupied while you were in this body. And when all things end, this whole world and physical material system terminates by the direction of God. There's the judgment. Now God's trying to prepare us for that. He's trying to tell us, and he does tell us, the gospel will save you. So let me ask you, if you haven't understood the gospel, don't you want to understand it? If you haven't obeyed what you have understood, what is there that's greater than solving the sin problem before you leave this world? If as a child of God, you've forgotten these things and you've let slip back into the ways of the world, you need to ask yourself the question, what's the difference to me now? than before I obeyed the gospel. As far as my service to Christ, my work for Christ, my talents used for Christ. So we can always in this world begin again. We can rectify things. We can change things by humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God and obeying Him.
to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. The Lord will add you to the church, Acts 2, verse 47. Therein you can serve Him faithfully until He comes again. Till it's time to step over into the eternal, as the prophet said, long home. As a child of God, as we let the affairs of this world creep back in, is the church taking second, third, fourth, fifth place in your life? Then it shouldn't because of the love your Lord has for you that He solved the problem for you. Long ago on that old cross, He cried out in your place, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because of, because of us. And that's the love that we sing about sometimes in the song. It says, Oh love that will not let me go. If you're subject to the blessed invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.